Third lecture, I'm going to talk about what's the long range and long term molecular space. Where I'll have the first discussion of non penetrating atomic, atomic Rydberg states. We'll talk about what's the channel Rydberg states and the long, ultra long range molecules and the properties that could. Experimentally, but I think it's an interesting area to explore. Uh, and we'll discuss how, uh, in collaboration with Matt Hartley, developed a treatment of non perturbative spin interaction with very molecule. So let me uh, give you some examples. So let, let me dive right into the non penetrating Whitbird state. The, the main point is that, stressed earlier, uh, I guess in the first lecture, that usually you don't even have to think about form defects very much unless you're looking for very high accuracy, except for SP, some heavier atoms. And so on. Uh, because the uh, turning point is in Bohr radii, at two Bohr radii. So, because every ground state or low lying state of an ionic core is, is never larger than two, three to five L radii. And, and basically, for these L greater than three, we can regard the Rydberg electron relationship as non penetrating. Um, I've been talking, mentioning at various times the close coupling equation, which is an integral differential. Equation when you have to include exchange um, because you have to tend to symmetrize the respective core electrons. Um, but for these non penetrating states, that's just a formality and you can just basically ignore that and treat the Rydberg electrons as distinguishable particles in the ion spectrum. And then basically, Electron will just interact through the induced or permanent multiple moments of the ionic core. And of course, for alkali atoms, uh, the core has uh, zero angular momentum and it has no quadratic momentum. So usually it's the induced moments that most of the atoms consider the misdemeanor. You start getting into the moments that, that do have an important orbital moment in the So, Way it might obscure some of the points. Um, so, the first story I, I wanted to discuss is the case of uh, having uh, that has non zero angular momentum. An unusual uh, term was predicted in the long range interaction uh, with Bernard Z back around 1990 that really puzzled. A lot of others, I think, Steve Bundy, as 
experimentalist uh, brought this to my attention. And that led to basically the, the treatment I'm going to show you here that is going to explain the origin of this really strange term in the long range interaction between the wood burning vitamin and the core that has the non zero. So here is a, a way to treat this sort of non penetrating states. You can expand the full wave function and fragment states of the core. This is what I've been calling the close coupling this phi i of omega is the full wave function of the ionic core in its various states, however many you have going to the convergence. But it also then is coupled uh, to the Rydberg electrons very homonic and spin to the J or the F spin orbit interaction is important. And then there is an unknown radial function, this mi of r, uh, which represents the radial degree of freedom. So you plug that in and project onto these phi j's, which are the set in principle, you get this set of coupled of differential equations. These are close coupling equations without exchange, so there's no integral differential term. Um, now, if you look at this matrix that really controls all the radial physics, it includes the ionic energy levels, it includes the centrifugal term, where for channel I. Um, these are diagonals, so there's a conic development function there. And then there's all the uh, Coulomb interactions, the ij of I, because there is a, a constant minus 1 over r that's common to everything, so I didn't need to include it. That's how to get added to whatever uh, we find by analyzing this matrix of the radial interaction. So now you can expand this in a series of powers of 1 over r, and for instance, using the multiple expansion for the interaction between the Rydberg electron core, if you will, because the Rydberg electron is outside the core, our lesser, in this case, exact same in terms of our lesser is the core electrons, and R is the Rydberg electrons. So, um, sorry, it's obscured a bit, but you know, I physics, we have to, the VIJ of R is the matrix element of the core electron, divided by the Rydberg electron for which is one, the first term of which is either dipole or natural. And, and usually that's the most important term for the physics of your atomic. So if you have, a, for instance, an example of a one electron ion core, an example might be calcium. Then this phi i channel function includes the, the radial, the full wave function of the and the angular parts of both electrons coupled to each other. Ooh. Ignoring spin orbit physics to, to keep things simple for the cost of So we could write these phi i in this notation of the radial wave function. The electron of the core and the core angular momentum. Rydberg and the L along the z-axis. Then these matrix elements are standard angular. Control you can see before when we divide it into the CJ coefficient, and you can have a simple difference in matrix of the individual transcript betas of the inner and outer electrons, and then there's a radio. radial integral of the core uh, electron wave function. Um, I should mention at this point that we're going to adiabatically diagonalize this helmet here, treating the distance r adiabatically, not the vector. And Ziegelman's treatment in 1990 
program that predicted a term in the long range Hamiltonian that could involve very phase and geometric geometric phase. Uh, we basically that arises if you treat Vector in that you get as the term looked like a vector for tensile, then bring in geometric tools and analyzing it. You might need to introduce a very tool to make the wave function a single value. Um, we usually prefer, at least, to just treat a scalar variable. Going to a scalar index, for example, as we do here, and it never enters the calculation. We have basically single value wave functions to be parted with, and that boundary condition is the same. So basically, if you look at this Hamiltonian adiabatically, second order perturbation theory, you'll get terms like this where you'll sum over all the states of the eye. This coupling makes this element squared divided by an energy denominator. But there is an interesting difference because the centrifugal terms were included in the adiabatic Hamiltonian. They show up in this figure. Now, if you don't, if you neglect this denominator, if you take the R going to infinity limit, this whole thing in parentheses is actually twice the channel. Which if it were an S electron core, this would just be the normal static polarizability. Here it will be some combination of what's usually called the scalar and the Lorentz polarizability. And that linear combination is determined by the L values of the We don't want to dwell on too much, but this should look somewhat familiar, this sort of second order perturbation from some of the dipole element squared divided by the energy denominator, which plays the principal states of the continuum states of the ion core. One could treat that by that one the Lewis method. But actually, I want to focus on the role of this centrifugal term in this denominator, which ends up being crucial to explain this somewhat unexpected term that has been predicted in the long term. So if we expand that denominator in a, in a binomial expansion, of course, you will get the, the first term will be this ordinary energy denominator. But then there is a correction term of order 1 over r squared uh, involves the energy denominator squared. And this difference of the LL plus 1 channels i and channel mu. Channel mu here is the, one, the, the channel you want to find the interaction in is part of that infinite space. So this uh, delta L squared, uh, how to analyze that, we uh, had to develop with my uh, graduate student, William Clark, and summarizing this review of modern physics article published in 1999. I'm summarizing the experimental and theoretical story about this. Uh, One way to look at it is that now when you put this delta L squared term in, it's going to give a 1 over R squared times the 1 over R four. So it'll give an overall 1 over R six term in the long range interaction. Now, uh, the, the term that we're going to have to extract is by analyzing this, notice that these Q's, by the way, these are the dipole There's this extra term in the difference of the centripetal energies of the numerator. You can rewrite this as a commutator of r hat, the angle of direction given by the electron. It's commutated with that. You can 
try to have the difference of cross products by minus r f plus l. And then you can recast that as this commutator crossed into the r prime half, which is in basically just in the other q for the because the prime j indicates a different integration variable. And then a cross product of the core electrons. So I, I realize this is rather mathematical, but I just come to kind of give a little hint where this term is going to, to come from. And so basically, in the end, you get a 1 over r6 term that looks like L, the Rydberg electron, the overlying momentum operator, dotted into a cross product of the core electron, which can be rewritten sense of the bigner Eckhart theorem as the core and the potential. So the bottom line is this term uh, that had been predicted by Bernard Siegelman, which surprised us, is the dot product of the core angle momentum with the Rydberg electron. Then there's a coefficient that comes out of evaluating the second order and it's all divided by r to the sixth. So this was surprising. Usually when you see a dot product of two angle momenta in physics, you think that's a strictly magnetic interaction. But this has no magnetic uh, origin whatsoever. This is just coming from the interplay of the rotational inertia with the electron rise to this surprising term that looks like spin orbit or something. It looks like a magnetic interaction, but it's not. L1 over C squared. Yeah, we didn't analyze it to the point, like, so it was a dot product, but we did have this delta L squared in the appendix of that. So the same the treatment of Clark, it sort of started from that treatment. But then we had to do a lot of bigger Rothschild recap to get it into the the thing was, Ziegelman, his paper had predicted that there must be such a term of this type, but he did not push the theory far enough. And it was an uh, important physical review letter to actually calculate the coefficient. So you could test this experimentally. But we were able to show that so you don't need to think about various phases. You can do phases. This comes out of standard This is a diagram we had in our Review of Modern Physics article trying to give a qualitative interpretation. Basically, if you have a term that looks like the dot product of the two angle momenta, then if you sort of imagine us orbit, orbiting electrons, uh, you could imagine this is a term that'll have an opposite sign depending on whether the electrons are going in the same direction. Basically, this is one way to understand roughly why there should be such a thing. In this case, in the case where they're orbiting in opposite directions, they have a lot less time to come close to each other out of the strong interaction. So that's all. Maybe I'll just say that Steve Lundin's group measured this by looking very carefully at spectra of Rydberg atoms. Neon was one of his first. Basically, found the green which is it's the long So that's all I wanted to say about this uh, weird term, and I wanted to show you how you can tackle problems like this by treating uh, the radius and in other problems and get different coordinates.
Okay, the next uh, example I wanted to talk about uh, relates to a physical review letter uh, that Matt Hiles, my good student, and I wrote in 2015. Um, partly thinking about other types of ultra-long length Wittberg molecules you could get if you got to if you involved atoms more complex than high atoms having just one valence electron moving outside closed shell core are very simple, whereas alkaline earth atoms with two valence electrons have perturbers in my talk first lecture. In particular, if you think about the 4S and B states, the ground states converging to the lowest ionization threshold B valence electron. Um, these can be perturbed by doubly excited states in 3D, 4D, and 3D, FS. And as a result, the quantum defect in this main channel, the 4S and B channel, is not a constant. All the calculations of trilobite molecules use feet, miniature, and meters, meter, uh, you have roughly constant quantum defects in all the S, B, and D sequence electrons, and then the rest of the quantum defects are negligible. Here is a case where, depending on the principal quantum number you look at, the D electron quantum defect is actually changing rather significantly. So we focused on these four states where the quantum defect actually goes through a sign change as it sweeps through the Rydberg manifold, which is the zero point. And it changes the way this D state will interact with the hydrogenic manifold. So see how the potential curves and wave functions change in the future. So this is a kind of showing for those four states um, as the D electron on the B state is for the N equals 18 it is above the The trilobite state that comes down, it's it's affected by that D wave quantum defect differently depending on where where the D state actually is. So here for this state, the D state is, is slightly above the hydrogenic threshold. For N equals 19, it's slightly below. You can see some changes in the potential. They're not so dramatic between 18 and 19. But for N equals 20, they start to look quite quite different. Now the D state is even lower. So it, it acquires some trilobite character as it as avoided crossing with the trilobite stage. And then as you go further to 21, the D state is starting to get completely removed from the trilobite stage. It basically is no longer playing such a dramatic role. Um, you can also see some changes in depths of the potential wells that have vibrational energies that can be measured spectroscopically as a result as you look through this range of quantities. No experiment has been done on this, but this is one of the predictions that has been made that demonstrates the difference in a phenomena that can happen in the perturbers compared to an alpha. Second thing we looked at a little bit different um, motivation is to have a real multi-channel Rydberg electron uh, perturber, uh, not looking now at the trilobite states that are coming out of the gray L state, the degenerate manifold, but seeing some effects from having a perturber and a perturber with Basically, the perturber is a very short range Rydberg wave attached to a higher pole. So, if you have an energy range of the spectrum, the perturber wave function is part of the wave function. It's much shorter range. 
So to tackle this problem, we, we want to pick a, a, a Rydberg atom with perturbers, like we chose silicon, a Rydberg atom, and we chose calcium as the ground state atom perturbed by to make an ultra long range Rydberg model. First, we had to do the exercise I discussed in this lecture. We had to fit silicon spectra to Lufano plots. Find the cane of crystal. Describe the different shades of 0, 1, 2, 3 symmetries of silicon. Then, once you've done that, you can do the quantum defect theory and find wave functions where there's a Rydberg electron converging sort of similar similar to the calcium or the carbon example I showed yesterday, um, where you have the two channels, 3P1, F4, and Cited group in 3F4. They have radial wave functions and they have a Z permeation function. That's the relative weighting of these functions in any particular state. And because the 3P3F state is, is a higher than threshold, that part of the wave function is much more strange than the 3P1F state. So let's see the effect of that on. Here are some examples of picked four particular states that have a perturber mixed in. This is kind of illustrating the potential of why the 3P 3 halves component is so much shorter range and has such a faster frequency with the current domain compared to the slow motion. So the main phenomenon I thought is interesting and could be worth exploring experimentally is that now you get basically from this wave function, just from the contact in that EMS wave delta function, this produces two wells in your potential. Two main wells. There's an outer well to this state, which has this 30. You get this normal looking outer well caused by the Rydberg lower channel, but then in its component in the upper channel that's so much shorter range, uh, more than a factor of two small R, you see another minimum. And in principle, you could capture atoms in both of those. So you see the effect Imagine having a field to an avoided crossing because you just move from one well to another. There could be a lot of interesting physics here to explore. And I just want to point out there are phenomena like this lurking that have Okay, the next thing I wanted to talk about is the origin, how to treat spin orbit scattering of an electron off. This uh, we tackled in uh, these papers in 2017, actually. It's just one main paper. It's in a couple of you know, typos and equations. And that's the 2018. So the, some of the difficulty in treating, especially rubidium dimers, and especially cesium that there's a very big spin orbit interaction, not only in the Rydberg atoms themselves, spin orbit splitting, hyperchart, um, the hyperchart often being negligible for the Rydberg electron, but not for the ground state atom. But when an electron scatters off the ground state, There's a shape resonance, and that shape resonance is at different energies, except for p zero and except for p one, and except for p two. Huge difference. I'll show you in the, the uh, 
fascias, scattering fascias for symmetry, you see this big shift in where those shape residents are going. And naturally, since the whole theory of rich overlapping river node was invented for fascias, uh, that's going to change and have a big effect on this spectroscopy. So, in the treatments before the, uh, this this work, and uh, well, there was some similar work uh, done by Hossein uh, a little earlier. I'll comment on it in a minute. Um, this physics is often neglected. It's just treated as a triple T shape resonance and it's generous in all the different J components of that shape resonance. So. Here, to treat this, we have to really consider all the angle momenta. And I've, I've listed them basically all the relevant angle momenta here. There's the S, S1, the, its orbital angle momentum, and the J quantum for the Rydberg electron. Then there is the spin of the ground state atom, assumed also to be the inner cesium here. Its nuclear spin and then the F, uh, the total angle momentum of the ground state due to the hyperfine splitting. Uh, so F, of course, vectorially is the vector angular momentum sum of I and S2. And um, other quantum numbers that come into this calculation are the total spin, because the electron ground state scattering is different. It's assumed to be triple. Uh, and then, as I've said, the J quantum number, which is the sum of S and L, capital L, the total orbital angle momentum of the electron pair about the perturbing ground state. So this is a rather complicated looking diagram that was in our uh, paper. The referee said it was totally uninterpretable. Here is the spin orbit dependent scattering fascias. Here's the shape resonance, the triple T0, triple T1, triple T2, cesium. In rubidium, it's a smaller effect, but still observable. So, to the, the, our challenge as we started to face this is how to generalize the Fermi Omont pseudo potential, especially this P rate. See in this P wave term, you have the scattering volume for P wave in the triple, and it doesn't have the J quantum number. It doesn't have any spin degree for phi of N. We have to find a way to make this allow to have a J dependent P wave scattering volume. And this was a, a really pretty hard problem. We tried several different methods until we really found the, the potential to solve it. Uh, we, I should say that the First treatment of this problem by Mr. Uh, Bots, who took us out in the proper time, 2002, had already included this physics to maintain some machine treatment. Uh, but we found that not so useful to try to show how to handle the, the, I mean, the main method being used to calculate these potential curves, which is basis set diagonalization with the atomic wave functions. So, our goal was to try to make a, a operator that has this J-dependent physics in it and find an operator representation to do that. This is a reference to, to Hossein's paper, which, I, which came very close. But sorry, Hossein, I think it's uh, incomplete. It didn't quite get the, the full uh, operator in his <coughs> Nevertheless, um, it, it went a long way toward, toward what was needed. Um, so our paper, which I think gives a, a full solution of this problem, I want to just try to convey the spirit of that derivation. And I should mention Peter Schmelter, who has also a treatment uh, shortly later, uh, which has basically the same solution. Um, so, what we're going to do as step one is convert this space dependent operator involving these weird gradient operators operating to the left and to the right, which has no J in it, 
first of all, we'll tack on the spin of wave freedom with a unit operator that, uh, like a projection operator, uh, onto the uh, triplet space. So the sum over all the ends of that. Which we'll write in this vector fashion of chi s for the two electrons on the dagger. Simply multiplying that unit operator in spin Hilbert space multiplies the space operator. Now, it's an interesting exercise in uh, figure rock algebra. We know that, at least in my group, people pick up the skill and it's really important to manipulate not only but also space the operator for the same angle momentum algebra recoupling. Basically, the first step is to regard the dot product of those two gradient operators as a rank zero tensor product, which is then multiplied by a rank zero projection operator, spin operator. So you can think of this as like four quantities whose angle momentum is totally coupled to a zero total angle. What we have to do now is systematically recouple this. So the gradient operator, which is the first rank operator, is right. It only pulls one character of the scattering off the tree. I think that's why the gradient I've written is just one super spin. Recouple that to the first spin operator and tack on the problem. And second combination with the spin operator that will add that one in F. So then it's a standard recoupling coefficient of four angle momenta, which is well known. Basically, it's this type of recoupling of four angle momenta to, uh, to accomplish this changeover. And so with these coefficients, which are simply the square root of 2j plus 1 over 3 times 2s plus 1, we'll end up canceling. This uh, recouple this into a form that the gradient combines now to make the different j values. Now I have in this operator that j is an explicit formula. And so I can bring this v inside it. With it it's appropriate. The fact that the two wave scattering volume is really the So after you then rewrite this tensor product as the Clark's Gordon sum, you have the full operator representation of the scattering volume. It's full J dependence is, is represented. So this has been uh, tested in some, some papers, uh, Enschlag group and Nigelmeyer. Resulting potential curves look like you see now the butterfly state is the state born out of this shape resonance. Now you see the splitting quite explicitly. The different values of the total projection or the total momentum onto the z axis uh, reflecting the spin of the splitting and the scattering. Uh, here is a, a table, but just a paper from. The, the, the table from the Diegelmeyer group paper in 2021, basically using this Hamiltonian and obtaining reasonably good agreement with the experimental spectroscopy on, on these different Richter-Lemmering Gruber molecules, most of them heterotopic. So we're pretty confident the theory does is um, one thing, one problem about the diagonalization method is kind of hinted at here for those of you who are ever going to do these calculations of these potential curves. This is a, an example of cesium where depending on the basis you include, you get different potential curves. And so they're really not quantitatively converged on what you would like. This is still the absolute field if you really want to push this 
for instance, if you are interested in the n equals 30 hydrogenic nanotubes in uh, the butterfly stage, the trilobi, and so on, um, usually one tries to include uh, n manifolds above and below and kind of hope it will be convergent. And this shows that, like the blue, I have three stages. In the black, I've added one more, and it just continues. Red, I added one more, and it was 27. It got higher still. Um, I sort of ended up saying, well, the best are probably the black, because those get the closest agreement with the Green's function equation. So copper comes through. Um, but ideally, we would like to have a method that is convergent. Um, well, I've been working with Matt Isles. We, we actually have a a treatment we haven't yet published uh, using Green's function formulation that we think is going to solve this problem and no longer be relying on the unconverged potential where it's almost like an adjustable parameter using change the basis until you get approximate agreement with the experiments. Yeah, I mean, you're adding here, the, for this particular convergence test, you're adding only below. And so maybe it's not surprising it's only for the end. If we were adding more symmetrically, it tends to work better. Well, it's a real effect. That, you know, if you add more below, it's going to be stuff that you need. So, Usually, yeah, it's usually better if you're going to add one below, you should also add one below. Just for this particular convergence test that I grabbed from Matt's thesis, that, it wasn't that much. Um, there is a Green's function. I mean, our, our treatment is based on the Coulomb boost. And of course, the Coulomb star Green's function is one, one, one could use that to spin and see that. But we found it so complicated already to just to do the calculus. So we have. Um, okay, so um, this is a comparison of some of our uh, tensor curves with the, the Stavazzi Green's function treatment for uh, rubidium. We have pretty, pretty good treatment. And the caveat is that uh, you sort of take the basis that gives you um, So our spin-dependent treatment gives, does give improved treat agreement uh, of some of the properties calculated by, in this study by Herbig Ott. They were the first ones to actually measure the butterfly river states, the, what, the bound ones that live down here. And I want to just talk a little about uh, a study in my remaining how they experimentally probed these and measured the permanent dipole moments of those states. And if you think of the rectangular quantum states that live in those wells, this was a Nature Communications article in 2015, driven by Herbie Cox group. Jesus Perez, Rios, and I were involved in, in some of the theory aspects of this. 
this is a butterfly state that uh, people were trying to see that never really been observed very directly until this work in Eric Brown. Uh, quite impressive experiment. This is N equals 70. They were not looking at such a high principal point, but the same shape they had for lower principal point. So let me talk a little about this. This is the potential curves they used in their study, in our study, uh, to interpret their experimental data. They were looking at the vibrational and rotational levels in these lower bounds. See, it's not so ultra long range now, it's only a couple of radii, meters, which has some advantages. Uh, you get a much uh, larger rotational speed. Uh, this one is much smaller. Uh, and these are just other, other pictures of the, of the state and, and this range of the one nice thing about the butterfly in this region is it's cutting through and interacting with the peak states, which makes it easier to observe. Because the butterfly state acquires a significant. This is a blow up of what the uh, individual wells look like that have these vibrational states and a picture of the spectrum. And then they focused on looking at the dipole moments, measuring carefully the field dependence of these this range of points. And um, here is showing like versus energy what the electric dipole moment they need to measure anywhere from a few hundred to buy up to 500. So basically, in the butterfly space, the, the, the Rydberg electron is mostly far on the outer side, past the neutral atom, away from the eye. So to model this, when they turn on an electric field, they use this sort of molecular Hamiltonian that has the rotational energy, Pn squared, which means that involving the moment of inertia. And the dipole moment, which they're trying to extract from this measurement, is dotted into the electric field. And they can diagonalize this and find the dipole moment. And I'm quite amazed to see this, this spectrum that we could go from very small field up to one volt per centimeter. Uh, you see the, the spark states Split. And you'll notice these energy levels are approximately equal in the phase. And that's because this is a dipole wave of electric field. This makes it possible to The low line quanta of the electric looks like it's one of the one. Of course, there are high states. This here. But anyway, from this and fitting this, we can reduce the dipole moment. So, one thing we did later, uh, again with Matt Eilis, was try to reanalyze that experiment. Uh, using the newest spin orbit and that had been the only one Kirby got through. And uh, we found somewhat uh, more uh, uh, better agreement between the theory and experiment of the electric dipole moments. It's discussed briefly in the 2017 paper. Uh, I think I don't have to discuss further detail. I just want to point out principle, the, it was a somewhat oversimplified theory, and you could do it if you want, but it, it still was able to see really these permanent dipole moments, very large standards, and 
axis of the star that is in is a closely So one thing that uh, I'm curious was shortly after our nature saw this huge leap in the number of people, like, wow, people really like this. Wow, it's like over 5,000 page views in a single day. And uh, so, that's nice, let's rest on my walls. Let's maybe analyze why, why was it that there was so much interest in this paper. By going a little deep into that, we found that there is an article summarizing a study which had this title. That's so interesting. Anyway, that's enough to take all this publicity. Anyway, that's my last slide. Thanks for listening. Well, that's that's interesting. Uh, it's like we did find an article by Michael Berry, where he was looking at orbital mechanics, seeing some similar trends. Gravitational magnetism, something like that. It's not really magnetic. It's not electrical currents causing magnetic dipoles. Magnetic dipole dipole is simply not that physics. If it was, there would be a 1 over c squared floating around. It's only maybe kind of a simulation of that. You want to put it in Ziegelman's term, yeah, where you have a vector definition, then yeah, this curl is maybe likely. Because then when you treat the vector, then you get a vector definition. And the curl of that is like a magnetic. And that vector definition never ends. Uh, I think I think we we I think only people are using these tools not to just vector identity but also tweaking the training shifts, tweaking the basis. It's all a little bit jumbled. I think we made a big small one.
Yeah, there there has been a discrepancy in the scattering lengths and in the volumes. Just take them what you think they are from the doesn't seem like the rigor principles are spectroscopic. Hoping that with the Green's function treatment, there's no convergence issue. That will at least el eliminate that degree of freedom. Try to But so far, it's been too complicated. We haven't achieved that. I think it's something that we can get to the point where we can do it quantitative without just adjusting everything. Oh, yeah. I'll, go get, I'll go get it. It's done. It's back on my laptop. Oh, no, I didn't. Actually, I wonder if I probably we could have gotten rid of that if you just if I click on yeah. the screen, but I don't know. Yeah. I Next time, maybe. <laughs> <laughs>